Welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. My name is Audrey Monkey, and I am your host. I've been a summer camp director for more than 30 years and have worked with thousands of campers, young adult counselors, and parents. Here at Sunshine Parenting, I share ideas, stories, and tips to help parents and anyone else who works with young people raise competent, kind, optimistic kids. I believe that together we can raise a generation of happy kids who bring positive changes to the world. Summer camp, parenting, and happiness are my main gigs here at Sunshine Parenting. So if you're interested in any or all of those topics, you've come to the right place. In this episode, I'm talking with Jennifer Joy Madden. She has a website at DurableHuman.com and has two excellent books that will help us all raise durable kids. The book that I talked with her about in this episode of the podcast is How to Be a Durable Human by Jennifer Joy Madden. I hope you enjoy our chat. Welcome, Jen, to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. I'm really glad to have you on here and to talk about your book, The Durable Human. Can you just tell a little bit about yourself and your background and how you came to write this book? Sure, happy to and and really, really glad to be here. Thank you. I am a health and environmental journalist, but I also wear other hats. Um, I am also um, a digital and broadcaster and was an adjunct professor for Syracuse University, uh, their DC program, the capstone for the graduate students. I'm also an active living and a child advocate. So I've done a lot of pro bono volunteer work uh, trying to establish new walking and biking trails. I happens to be throughout Northern Virginia. So I was appointed a county commissioner of transportation, uh, but I specialize and advocate for walking and biking and active transportation in that position. I'm also a maker and a designer. So as we'll probably talk about, there are uh, there's a huge area where design is needed in parenting. As I like to say, there's no lunchbox for social media. So I try to come up with ideas, simple ideas that even parents can do themselves to be able to manage, manage time, manage, you know, just people being able to be together rather than overtaken by their technology. So I've developed some products for that. And I'm a mother of three durable young adults. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So that's, uh, <laughs> How old are your uh, adult children now? They're 34, 29, and 24. Okay, so those those are lucky kids who were pre-digital, <laughs> which um, I, I've often reflected. I, my oldest is 24, and she really was not. She had a smartphone when she was 18. And, you know, her experience was very different than the ones that my teenage sons are having now as current 14 and 17 year olds. So I always kind of wistfully look back upon my early parenting days, which were during the pre digital pre email internet era, which is just crazy to think. So it's so great to have you on. There's so many different things that I enjoyed about your book. But why don't we start by just you explaining what you mean by being durable humans and raising durable human kids? Sure. Uh, a durable is different from resilient. Resilient means to be knocked over, have some problem happen, and then you get yourself standing back up again. And that's great. But durable means to be effective for as long as possible in your mind, your, your body, and how that works, and also your relationships with other people. So it's being strong and secure and moving forward taking in and and reacting to the experiences you have along the way to continue to stand strong through it all, learn and become wiser. And that's the idea of being durable. Yeah, I really like that. I was, I I was kind of thinking of 
what the opposite was. And one of the things I've heard people refer to some of the kids today as being a fragile generation mm-hmm. and um, fragile mm-hmm. seems to be, you know, one of the <laughs> opposites of durable. If you're thinking about someone who's durable, although I guess it could also be the opposite of resilient. Um, but I just really liked, and I also like how your book spans sort of durability for all ages. So really it's for all humans, as you say, that, the things that we can all do to be more durable. And I especially want to focus today on just the things that you recommend for parents and how we can help make sure we do what we can to help our kids become durable humans. So why don't we talk with that? You you talk in your book about the triple crown of durability. Um, why don't you just mm-hmm. explain what those three parts are? Um, or if you want, I can just, we can just start with one of them with self-reliance, which I just love that topic in when we're talking about parenting and raising kids. What are some of your suggestions for parents about raising kids to be more self-reliant? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, definitely having them help out from an early age around the house and to take care of their own rooms and that sort of thing. And I advocate for having them start making their lunches pretty early. In fact, my one son, I had him do, you know, a pictorial of how to put a lunch together. So it would be, you know, fruit, vegetable, sandwich or something, you know, and whatever else you think should be in their lunch. And then he just had that. We just had that on the counter and he would just, you know, fill his lunch box up with those things. And so that's, a way that they can be more self-reliant and always help you out when you're doing your chores. I always felt like, you know, if I was working, you know, like folding laundry or something like that, and they were sitting on the couch or something, I I felt always that they should help. Mm -hmm. It's just the the right thing to do. And then everybody is done faster with the work. So it's just a matter of not giving them a hall pass from things like that. What else? Uh, To you got to have time management around your house to make sure that they are well balanced. So actually to, you know, in your mind kind of apportion their 24 hours and things they need to do and not let something uh, go overboard. So if, even if they're comfortable playing a game online for hours, it doesn't mean that they should do it. So it's just having this in your head, kind of keeping track of what they're up to and explaining it. Uh, I actually, a tool that I really love for parents is the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics Media Time Calculator. You can search for that online. Uh, it's part of their family media plan. And it's really, really great. It, you put your kid's name in there. It's all online, but it's, it's, no, it's not shared or saved anywhere. It's just you filling out this little form and then you can print it out if you want. But, the kid's name is there and then their age. That's, age is really important because the, the, this planner of a child's day has what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends for not only sleep, but also believe it's physical activity too. So it comes pre-populated. So let's say your kid is seven. Automatically in this 24 hour planner, 11 hours are already apportioned to sleep. So it helps you. And if you sit elbow to elbow with your kid and you click off all the things they need to do during the day, like get dressed Mm -hmm. and walk to school and eat and all this, there's a little box. Well, it starts out as a big box of media time. And they see as you click into the other things they have to do in their day, that media time shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. They're lucky if they have 15 minutes or half an hour at the end of the day to be playing around online. And so it's really, really effective because it kind of takes you out of the middle. You're both looking at this tool and they're like, oh, makes sense. You know, so sweet. I love it. It's a design and we really need these designs because there really aren't very many designs out there to help parents. Oh, that sounds terrific. I'll definitely find that and put a link in the show notes so that people can access that calculator and I'll check it out. Um, you mentioned, I think in some of our email correspondence that you're somewhat familiar with summer camp. And I think one of the things that parents really appreciate about camp is that we have built in lots of the things, pretty much all of the things actually that you talk about that create durable humans, uh, because the structure is very much set up for them and they do not have any devices. All of their time is spent on 
all those other things, the connection, face-to-face connections with other people, doing chores and being self-reliant for their own belongings and just that lots of sleep. So I really, that resonated with me as I was reading this, that as adults, we can really create settings for kids Mm -hmm. that help them be more durable. Um, Another Mm -hmm. concept that you um, talk about, so let's just switch that is genuine relationships. And this is one of my favorite things. I I just feel like we are sometimes short selling our kids by the too much structured activity and too much time online that they're not getting enough, just genuine time with friends to connect and play and work out, you know, social Mm -hmm. skills. So talk about how you see genuine relationships being a key part of your triple crown of durability? Well, just to be really practical about it, it's funny that uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs, they're very good at reading people's faces. That's part of the way that they can sell their ideas and promote their ideas and actually serve people by reading people. And so that's really the key to why kids need to look, know how to sit down and look people in the eye. And it, it starts uh, in families at dinner time. And so I really advocate the, the gadget basket, which would be a container next to the table, but out of reach of everyone. And that when people approach the table for a meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, to turn off their phone, silence them, and, or whatever devices they have, and put it in there. Because that's where it really happens at dinner. Not only are kids learning how to have face-to-face conversations and, and wait, take their turns, and listen, uh, it's a really great opportunity for parents to keep an eye on their kids day to day. And I literally mean keep an eye on because if you're looking at them, they're making a comment. Maybe their words are saying something, but their eyes, something happened. You're watching them and this expression came over their face really quickly. If you're not looking at them, you're going to miss it. Catherine Steiner there wrote a great book called Disconnected and she uh, talks about missing the many moments of childhood. Mm. So parents and children, I believe, have to structure time in their days so they can actually have some of this face-to-face uh, time together. And meals seems to be the easiest place to do that. Oh, I, I yes, I agree a hundred percent. I've I've written and researched a lot about just family dinner, and again, just mm. from my experience at camp, a lot of our time at camp is spent, you know at meals together as a group at, around the campfire and the kids really thrive and really enjoy all that connection time. And for me personally, mm-hmm. family dinner is probably my favorite time of every day because it is the time that no matter what else is going on, we're all gathered there. And even with teenage sons, they participate, we all chat and it's really, it's such an important time. And I think that it has gone by the wayside. I know in your book, you talk about some people saying that they spend zero time on meals because they're always multitasking. Um, and that mm-hmm. seems to be the trend. And I was kind of horrified to hear that that's how a lot of people live. So kind of talk about a little bit about how, what you learned in your research about that. Yes, well, that's true. You know, people become disconnected. Uh, attachment is a very important uh, aspect of our lives. Uh, it starts at birth, actually a little bit before birth that the child actually starts attaching to the primary caregiver in that case, that would be the mom. But after the baby's born, it could be somebody else, uh, a father or a grandparent. But that would be their primary caregiver. And there's a physiological neural process that happens where the kid uh, becomes literally sort of physically, mentally attached to their caregiver But something else happens because of the beautiful cuddling that happens during the feeding time and touching and eye contact. That's when kids learn how to use, uh, how to to read faces, which is actually a survival skill. And that's really important. What uh, addiction specialists that I've talked to, I actually went to the first, the nation's first uh, internet addiction treatment center. And they worry that a child's first image when they come out of the womb is 
going to be um, obscured by a device. Mm. And they're not kidding around. They're mm. saying that uh, this is happening. Um, there's actually a product that's being, it's trying to be developed that, I, that I've seen out there that clips a cell phone to a baby bottle. Oh, we no. have to understand what our human, yeah, we have to understand what our human needs are and that we, these kids need our touch and our, um, our eye contact to feel secure because kids that don't securely attach to a caregiver in probably the first nine to 18 months of life, they become agitated and insecure and they really have a trouble. They have trouble coping. Mm -hmm. They do not self-regulate well. So we need to wake up and understand how important it is that we feed these special mechanisms early in life of, of, of they're like love, love mechanisms, you know, to, make sure the child feels loved and safe because otherwise they're going to be shaky maybe their whole lives. Mm. Yeah. So it really, it really speaks to, par- and I, I've seen the same thing. It's, you know, parents are all talking about teenagers and kids using their phones too much, but when you look around, all the adults are doing it too. So we're modeling for the next generation, how to appropriately use these things. And if, you know, if a child, all they ever remember is their mom and dad being on these devices, it's, it's going to be hard for them to learn those skills, those so important skills that they need to have. So, wow, that's, that's scary to think about a a phone attached to a baby bottle. That's terrible. <laughs> trying to be, trying to substitute. And I, I have heard the, that your brain does not react the same way to a, a screen image of a face as it does to the real person in front of you, that there's different neural connections and things happening. So the face to face thing is very real and so important for, for our kids. Uh, one thing I'd also like to mention since you brought that up, uh, in France and Romania, Doctors have uh, identified a problem that they're calling virtual autism, mm. and it's in kids under age four. And what happens is the kids have free reign all day to be on a tablet or watching TV or doing things like that on screens for hours and hours. And after days and days, these kids, little toddlers, they stop responding to their names. You can't catch their eye, and they become indifferent to the world around them. So those doctors in Romania and France have gotten really upset about it. Some U.S. Uh, you know, neuro, neuro, neurologists and, and doctors are also doing the same. But the thing is, Audrey, you'll be happy to hear this. When kids return to a regular kid lifestyle and they're playing with physical objects, they are outside with other kids and they're talking to their mom and dad and they are removed from screens completely, that, quote, virtual autism goes away. Mm. And so that's really super, super good and wonderful. But it's really scary when you think about what if nobody ever steps in for these kids, what's mm. going to happen. Mm. And that means their brain will be wired and then they'll become, a, um, you know, addicted to devices and looking autistic. So it's, pretty dang serious. We really right. have to be careful it about is. this. <laughs> I know. I, I always think that we're, it's the children are a living experiment right now. This, you know, this generation of kids who have been raised since birth on mm-hmm. these screens, we don't even realize. I mean, we all know intuitively and we're already starting to see the effects, but it is, it's truly scary that, that, and I will definitely look that up and learn more about that too. And I, again, I've been interviewing a lot of people about just how they're getting their kids unplugged and different ideas. And what it, if kids are in an environment like camp or like schools that have chosen to not allow phones, they are relaxed mm-hmm. and fine because they're not worried about being the only one left out. So that's part of the issue is sort of we have to set up better guidelines out in the world. We can do it at home too. But I know with my kids who are teenagers, their, their perception is that their friends don't have any controls so that when I say, okay, we're turning everything off, we just shut our internet down an hour before bedtime so that it's really simple. Every device goes off and they, mm-hmm. you know, they say that they're the only ones in high school who have that, which I know is not true, but it does make it, you feel a little bit bad because you think, oh, well, that's how they're, you know, they're playing these online games with their friends and talking to their friends via Skype while playing. And now you're, shutting them off. So I really want communities and people to get more on board together with setting these smart guidelines and 
you know, encouraging the kids to mm-hmm. have for sure some times every day and some spaces like their room that are tech free. And I know that's your, you've been a proponent of that as well. If you were talking to parents, I know you do talk to parents. Um, what are the guidelines that you would give for say someone who has maybe just, let's just pick like a 12 year old kid. What would you say would be appropriate for them at that age to be durable, to have kind of a well-balanced life? Okay. Well, definitely, uh, make sure that the bedroom is off limits to any of electronics. Because not only do they go deep in the night and they tend to wake people up randomly, but uh, it's also a huge temptation for kids. Mm -hmm. But the third thing is that they don't have very many places where they can do mental digestion. So it's like they're inputting, they're taking in information all day, all day, all day. And then they just, they need some time to actually think about what happened to them. It develops their sense of conscience and it gives them a respite from all the input. Mm-hmm. And so that if there is a no electronics in the bedroom opportunity for them, then they have that wonderful time of sanctuary in their room. And what you do is you give them an alarm clock and don't take the excuse of, I need a phone in there because I need to, uh, you know, wake up because it's in my alarm. Nope. And then just make sure you train them from the earliest age. If you want to give your kid a phone as early as 12 years old, uh, you could make sure train from the very beginning that they, they charge it and out of the bedroom. K- kitchen's a good place. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I, yes. I'm actually going at, and so that as far as whether a 12 year old should have a phone, that's a whole other conversation we can have, but a smartphone is, you don't have to have a smartphone. They actually still make phones that are simpler. Mm-hmm. And you could even at that age might be better to have in a case of emergency phone. I call it an ice phone. Mm-hmm. So it's, the family's phone. They use it when they go out. If they do go out to the mall with their friends, perhaps they would just use it then. So they don't have their own phone quite yet. Uh, other things they need to keep their, to their bodies and their minds durable is to, yeah, make sure that use the family time calculator and make sure they get their uh, physical time every day. They're supposed to move an hour a day. If and maybe I guess you can go to brass, you know, brass tax and figure out if they had PE that day, but. Ideally, they should get yeah. more, more exercise after school. I mean, some of these kids are like born lawyers and want to negotiate everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, eat fresh food. We need to keep our bodies healthy by doing that. And then, of course, trying to have a, a family time of gathering every day. You know, if you can't figure out dinner, then maybe your special time is breakfast. So you need to add in some time in the morning. And then... Uh, yeah, that's that's about it. If they spend a lot of time on computers doing their homework, even at age 12, what's happening is that all over Asia, there's just an epidemic of nearsightedness. People mm-hmm. are getting myopic because they're only looking at one focal length, which is, you know, mm-hmm. a foot away from their face. So teach them good digital hygiene when they're using a computer screen to look away from the screen every 20 minutes for 20 seconds. And just to stare off in the distance because that's going to keep their eyesight dur- durable, and then and then they they won't need glasses. So there are some physical things that they need to keep in mind if they're going to be using screens. Yeah, that's that's excellent um, information. And I actually watched that in the video that's on your homepage, the interview on TV or something. You talked about that, and I was looking mm-hmm. at that. That's like that's a great tip. Okay, so the final part of the triple crown of durability is curiosity. Do you want to talk about that as it pertains to kids and what parents can do? Yes, definitely. Well, summer camp is a wonderful place. You have a schedule, but I'm sure there's time where people, there's free time and people can kind of do what they want to do and and look around. and, And that's really, curiosity is every person is unique and they're interested in different things and then that makes them a broader, fuller person and they can contribute more to society if they develop their own individual self. And so they need opportunities to follow their curiosity. What's happening with parents, if parents take a kid to a playground or a park, it's almost like the parents are not patient enough to stay there. Mm. So it's really important to realize that. So they may be sitting by the playground for like 20 minutes and then they're like, 
tap in their toe and then they have to go. Mm. They really have to honor the kid's ability to uh, get into imaginary play and to, in that way, follow their curiosity. So Angela Hanscom is just a brilliant occupational therapist who wrote a book called Balanced and Barefoot. And she found that uh, kids are coming into her practice so often, they're they're clumsier. They don't know their own bodies. They don't know their own strengths. They're emotionally fragile, as you mentioned. She says that these kids need up to three. She would like to see everybody outside for three hours a day in unstructured play mm. because it create it, it makes them so durable in terms of um, this idea of a little bit of risk taking, problem solving, imagination stretching. And so I think we really have to we have to start to respect these types of things and that the power they have when kids get older uh, to become adults, that they become more, have more leadership potential that way. And they actually might be able to take care of their families more effectively and they'll take care. They'll know their bodies better. They won't be as clumsy when you're out there climbing on stuff. You're learning how to balance and your limbic system is, they need like 360 degree movement to get their brains and their balance system sort of in order. And when you're outside, uh, Angela writes about sensory integration. When a kid is playing outside, all their senses are, uh, they're actually active at once. And that really helps a person to be, to be very good at sensing things. I know it sounds funny, but there's some kids that don't even want to walk outside because their feet are like, oh, I can't touch mm-hmm. anything on my feet. Ooh, ooh, ooh. No, get them out there get them exposed to dirt and it's really important for us to do that for our overall health and immunity to at least get a little bit dirty exposure to dirt and that's been associated with less fewer allergies and stuff like that but uh angela if you listen to her or and others this one hour of play a day physically that's important angela believes it takes about 45 minutes for a kid to drop into imaginative play Mm. and that's so important so parents we have to stop we have to find ways not to be so impatient so our kids can actually let loose literally and they can kind of go into their imaginary world and it's just so so important I'm sure you've seen those, uh, the the forest kindergartens oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. I wish every kid could go to forest elementary school (laughs) where they just are outside for pretty much most of the day and you know, exploring and climbing and all of that. And what's amazing with kids is, you know, I once heard someone say that, you know, they don't want to allow campfires because of the danger of it. And here, you know, we're at camp, we have campfires every night and our kids are as young as six years old and they completely have the sense and the ability to know, you know, not to stick their hand or their foot in the fire. And Unless kids are allowed to explore and be, you know, near campfires and, you know, climbing around on trees and all that, they won't, like you said, get the balance and get the perception of realizing which risks are, you know, bigger or smaller. And we really need kids to have that time to explore and play outside. It's so, so important. I would love for everything. It would be great if all schools were just outdoors. Yes, it would be wonderful. I love, um, and it's not only physical coordination and knowing your own body. It's that the Rain Tree Preschool in St. Louis is, is amazing. And these little toddlers go out and they go way out in the field and they go down a ravine and sort of spend their time there. The ravine is hard to get up and down. It's slippery. It's tough. Mm-hmm. And so it's when a kids first start there, they really hard, it's hard to get up when you're three years old. But the stronger ones, the ones who figure it out, I saw there's a video we could dig it up uh, where the ki- little kids on top are encouraging the ones. I'll never forget the scene. Oh. They're encouraging the little ones in the bottom and they're saying, you can do it. You oh. can do it. And the little ones get up that hill and then they all embrace when they get up to the top. It's just. Oh my gosh. So wonderful. Oh yes. Let's try to find that. We could put a link to it in the, in the show notes. Well, this has been really terrific. I'd love for you to share just the names of your books and your website, and I will put links to them in the show notes, but why don't you just talk about where people can find more of your work and learn more about this great research you've been doing about being durable humans? <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, my website is durablehuman.com, just durablehuman.com. And there are links on there 
So I have a book that they can download for free that I'd love for them to download right there called The Durable Human Manifesto. And it's very short, but it's very sensory. It's got beautiful, beautiful pictures. And it, uh, it, it encourages you to go see Mr. Rogers. I think maybe I have a link in there, actually, to go to see Mr. Rogers' um, video, Garden of Your Mind, which if you ever need to be cheered up in a day, just go to watch mm. Mr. Rogers, a little song on YouTube, Garden of Your Mind. But anyway, uh, then also you can get my other book on Amazon, How to Be a Durable Human. And as you said, that's got advice for parents and little sections at the end of each chapter for kids. And then there's a chapter just for kids about paying attention, about why we need to pay attention to them or what we need to pay attention to and that sort of thing. So I would, I would love people to come and visit durablehuman.com. Awesome. Well, this has been so terrific, Jen. I really enjoyed just getting to know you and your work. And it's just an important message that you're getting out there. So thank you so much for being on my podcast today. You are welcome. Thank you. I really enjoyed chatting with Jen about ways we can help our kids be more durable and ourselves. You can find notes, links, and information about this episode at sunshine-parenting.com and search for episode 30. I'm going to close this episode with the closing words from Jennifer Joy Madden's book, How to Be a Durable Human, Revive and Thrive in the Digital Age Through the Power of Self-Design. She says, every day, do things your smartphone can't. Watch the sunset. Sniff dewy magnolias, walk barefoot in the grass, get lost in a book, make something, giggle with your baby, hug your teenager, daydream, sing and dance, play charades, tell stories, linger with someone older and wiser, take a nap, listen to crickets, follow your heart, savor the privilege of being human. (music) 